Now, here is the same for a pet camera, but that is a bit more complicated. So suppose that these are two detectors of a pet camera. And of course, they, in the real life, they will be three dimensional. So they, we have an X dimension here, which goes up, an R dimension here. And then, of course, we have a Y dimension, but that is orthogonal to the slides. And then the drawing is very poor because the, the, the size of these crystals is typically four millimeters. And distance between the two systems is typically like 80 centimeters. But if I draw it like that, you wouldn't see anything. So this is dramatically deformed. And now the question is, what happens if I put a point source exactly in the middle? What sensitivity do we have? How to compute it? Well, here for symmetry, if I put it here, we know that if one photon hits the crystal, the other photon, which is emitted in the other direction, will also hit the crystal. So for a start, we can just look at one detector here and this point source, and then we can do the, the calculations that we had before. So d squared divided by the radius squared, and then times two, because there is another detector here. Now, if we move this point source away from the center towards the detector, then as you can see in this little drawing, now the bottleneck becomes this detector. Any photon that hits this detector will also hit that detector, but not the other way around. So to compute what happens, we have to look at that detector. And that means that the sensitivity of this detector to that point source decreases with the square of the distance from here to here. Okay, so if we go from the center to the edge, we double the distance to the bottleneck detector. And because of that square, that means that if we have a value of one here, we would have a value of 0.25 here. So it, the sensitivity decreases quadratically if we move away from the detector. But that is if we move from left to right. So now we can also see what happens if we move up and down, so if we change the value of x. Now, one thing which is obvious is that once this point source moves beyond this red line, the detector pair will not see anything anymore, because if one photon hits the detector, the other one will escape from the detector. And then, um, now you can see if, if it, I, well, you can, you can check that if I move this source, um, in between these dashed lines, then this detector is always the bottleneck detector. And actually nothing much changes. The distance from that point source to the detector stays the same. The detector area is the same. The only thing that changes is this angle. But recall, the, the detectors are very small. The distance between the detectors is very large. So nothing happens. But as soon as the detector uh, passes this dashed line, both detectors become bottleneck. So this one is a bottleneck for this line, and the other one becomes a bottleneck for the other line. And you can quickly check if I move this point source from the dashed line to the red line, then the sensitivity decreases linearly. So that means that the profile looks like this. So in the middle, if I move the source, we have an immediate decrease of the sensitivity. If I do that here, then as long as I'm between the dashed lines, the sensitivity is constant, so smaller than here. And once I pass the dashed line, the blue line, it starts decreasing linearly until the red line. And here at this point in the detector, we basically always have that this one is the bottleneck. And the probability of getting a photon from here to here is the same uh, with very good approximation because this detector is very small. So we have a very weird sensitivity. And here is a nice plot of that. So again, it's two dimensional, but we can. I have only one dimension x here. There is another dimension y that you don't see. And again, you see this quadratic decrease. And here, the PSF is rectangular. And here it's rectangular. So that looks ugly, because what we want in a PET scanner is actually that a PET would measure something that is, with good approximation, equal to a line integral. And this drawing suggests that we have a weighted line integral with very complicated weights that we would need to take into account. Very inconvenient. So with what I just said, and you can check it in the course, you can easily compute the point spread function as a function of this x, which is the one of the detector dimensions, y, the other detector dimension, and r, which is the distance along this line of response. But now with that expression in the course, you can also easily check that if you integrate that over uh, 
dx over x and y, and meaning over the detector area that you get a constant here. So we integrate over x and y, but also r vanishes. So that means that the average sensitivity uh, is independent of r. And that's very interesting. So that means if we have an object which is large compared to the um, detector sizes, that then the sensitivity, and if that object is uniform, then the sensitivity of the detector pair to that object is always the same. So if I put a large object in the center, I get a number of photons, and most of those will actually come from the, the very center of that object. If I move that same object here, I see the same amount of photons, but now fewer will come from the middle and more will come from the side. But if that part of the object is more or less uniform over these four, or five central millimeters, then it doesn't matter. Okay. So that means if you do quality control in a PET camera and you use a point source, then you can have very weird effects because a point source would reveal this kind of sensitivity. And if you put a point source at strategic places, the PET will see more photons than if you put it at other places. As soon as the object is a bit larger than that, you take a small sphere or something, then those effects are gone, and you will see nicely that no matter where you put the, um, the source along the LOR, the detector pair will always see the same thing. This little drawing illustrates what I just said. So assume that these are all pet detectors. And then I asked the computer to connect all pet detectors with one another. Now, I didn't use too many pet detectors. If I would use a realistic number, then the whole thing would be white. You wouldn't see anything. But now you see this cool drawing. And the reason to do that is to show that in the middle here, there is an excessive symmetry. And again, if you do quality control measurements and you put a line source or a point source exactly in the center of the scanner, then the system sensitivity to that is extremely high. And as soon as you move it to the left or to the right, the sensitivity drops dramatically. And that happens in the very center of the pet, but as soon as you move away from the center, just uh, one or two centimeters is enough, you end in, up in this more messy uh, sampling area, there these effects don't play. And so, for example, Christoph Bata has found that when he did quality control measurements on our CT, on, on our GE uh, uh, pet systems, then he found uh, yeah, very weird values. We found it very difficult to reproduce the values uh, reported by GE, but that is because there is a huge variation. Again, as soon as the object is a bit larger than that, all these effects vanish. Then we can wonder, okay, suppose we put a point source exactly in the middle of the scanner here, to keep things simple, how many photons will we see? And the answer can be computed in the very same way. We can think of a very big sphere that would see all the photon pairs. The area of that, of, of that sphere is, is 4 pi r squared. And then we compute the area of the sphere covered by the PET scanner, which is 2 pi r, which is the perimeter. And we multiply that by the distance d, which is this one. So if we compute the ratio, we simply find that this is the crystal size divided by the diameter. So if this would be 4 millimeter and the diameter would be 80, uh, centimeter, um, we get a value of 4 divided by 800 is, is 1 in 200. So just with a single ring of detectors, the, the PET would already do a few orbs of magnitude better than the gamma camera. The, that one had a value of 1 in 5,000. This one with a single ring gets already a value of 1 in 200. If you buy a PET scanner these days, you don't get one single ring of 4 millimeters, you, you get a series of rings worth about 20 or 25 centimeters. So the sensitivity of a PET is really much, much better than that of a gamma camera. Um, geometrically, I mean, independent of the atoms. And that means that um, for PET traces, we can actually use uh, terribly poisonous compounds because we need them in so low a concentration that they will be uh, harmless to the patient at least most of the time. Well, it can be different for neurotransmitters because if you, uh, and the concentration of neurotransmitters in the brain is not that high. And so if you would 
uh, have a neurotransmitter with low specific activity, then the amount of trace you inject could to some extent start competing with the uh, natural neurotransmitter. But that should normally not happen. All right, then we have to look at resolution effects. And uh, they are a bit different in PET than in SPECT. So in SPECT, everything is nice. The photon is emitted from the atom or from the isotope and is direct and then travels along a straight line if we're lucky. That is not so in PET. A positron is emitted with a lot of kinetic energy. And it first needs to travel uh, and interact with a lot of other uh, electrons before it can annihilate. So in all these interactions, it loses energy. And only when its energy is almost zero, it can interact with uh, an electron and annihilate and then to produce two photons. So this travel distance is one reason we lose resolution because we want to see this point and not that point. And then it depends on the uh, isotope, uh, how far that atom will travel. Now, the, they are emitted with some kinetic energy, but that's not a fixed energy. That is a whole spectrum of energies. And uh, here, the maximum uh, energy of the positron is listed. And you see that for fluor, for example, fortunately, that maximum energy is pretty low. And as a result of that, um, the maximum travel distance of the positron in water or in tissues is 2.4 millimeters. And the average is about 0.6 millimeters. It depends a bit on which reference you check what the, is the value given here, because the mean for without maximum all that produce different results than we are used to. And the reason is that the point spread function associated with this uh, positron travel is not Gaussian at all. It's a very peaked curve. And so it's it different from what we usually use. But then you see that for older traces, uh, for example, gallium that we are using more and more, the maximum travel distance is much longer than the average too. So we lose significant amount of resolutions by just going from fluor to gallium. Um, and rubidium is, is worse. So in Belgium, we don't have the problem because Belgium is covered with cyclotrons. So we don't need rubidium. Uh, we can take cyclotron products uh, instead. Rubidium can be produced by a generator. And so in other countries, or for example, in the US where the cyclotron density is lower, um, many sites buy uh, a rubidium generator and use rubidium uh, labeled traces. But the drawback of that is a significant loss in the resolution. Okay, so as I just said, the positron has almost no kinetic energy, but there is some left, so it has some momentum. And that electron uh, probably also has a bit of momentum. And that means that the total momentum of the two particles is not zero. And when they annihilate, they produce two photons. And the total momentum associated with these two photons should be the same, so also not exactly zero. And that implies that they cannot travel in exactly opposite directions. Fortunately, the momentum is very small, so that the deviation from uh, the line is, is small. It's about half a degree. And so for uh, a distance of one meter between the detectors and looking at the middle here, you lose about 2.2 millimeters. If you go closer and closer to one detector, that effect becomes less and less uh, damaging. If you're all the way here, then the acolinearity doesn't matter because uh, well, this photon will directly go here and the other photon, it doesn't matter what angle it has, it will always be detected. So the uh, that also means that in acolinearity for small animal imaging, it doesn't harm us. So the smaller we make the pet, the less we suffer from this acolinearity effect. The positron range, that is the same for all pet systems. Then we have to look at what we can detect. And the reason is that we not only detect what we would like to see, but also a lot of other stuff that we need to correct for. What we would like is that a uh, positron annihilates with an electron, emits two photons, and those are not attenuated at all in the body of the patient, and then they undergo photoelectric effect. And if they both nicely do that, then we will have two detections in coincidence. The PET scanner will detect both, compare the detection times, and decide that something happened along that line. And if it is a tough PET, it will also figure out where along the line. 
So this is good, but other stuff can happen. And here is a very frequent other uh, event. So one photon gets uh, all the way to the scanner like we want, but the other one interacts with an electron, is undergoes Compton scatter, and then uh, still gets detected. Um, it will lose some energy here, but the energy resolution of the PET camera is finite. So there's a good chance if that angle is not too large that it will be accepted. So then we have these two scintillations and we will think that along this dashed line, something happened while it actually happened here. And that means that scatter can actually uh, create uh, coincidence lines which are outside the patient. And that never happens in a gamma camera. So if you measure a single photon scattered in a gamma camera, then that photon must come from, out, from somewhere in the patient. Uh, so that means that you can use in single photon imaging the scatter to find information about the body outline, but you cannot do that in PET at all because these scatter lines can be all over the place. What the PET scanner sees actually most of the time is signals. So one photon manages to reach a detector, but the other doesn't. And the chance that the photon does not reach a detector is actually much higher than the chance that it gets into the detector. First is geometry, but second is also attenuation. So the chances that the photon will interact with the patients are actually pretty high. So that means most of the scintillations that are detected are actually signals. Um, that's not a problem if we measure a single signal, we know we cannot do anything with it and we discard it. The only problem is that it creates some dead time in that detector. So if there is a huge amount of signals, you will suffer from dead time. And another problem with signals is that if two of them are nasty enough to arrive at the same time, then we will think that they belong together. And then we have this dashed line here where we think something happened, while in reality, nothing happened. Again, these dashed lines are uh, they can go through the patient, but they can just as well go uh, outside the patient. And uh, the randoms typically are very uniform, have a very uniform distribution. And here are some uh, little calculations to see how the geometry of the PET system affects the relative amounts of trues, scatters, signals, and randoms that we acquire. Now, for a real patient, that would be a very complex calculation. So here we consider an object, the easiest one that I could think of, that produces meaningful results. And so here the patient is replaced by a radioactive wire, which is this line here, and it has a, a activity concentration or an amount of activity per centimeter of rho. And then it's put in an attenuating cylinder with diameter r and attenuation coefficient u. And then the attenuation, so the exponent of minus r times mu equals a. So a is a value smaller than one saying how many photons survive the attenuation. We consider a coincidence time window tau. So if two photons arrive within the same tau, then we assume they are a coincidence. And the detectors have an efficiency epsilon, meaning that if a photon hits the, hits the detector, there is a chance f uh, epsilon that will actually be accepted. And there is a chance minus one minus epsilon that the photon will travel through the detector or deposit so little energy that we uh, don't accept it. Okay. So now we can compute how many truths we ex expect. So the truths have to come from within uh, this uh, tube of response, if you wish. So that means only the central activity here, rho times d, that can contribute uh, activity. So the activity seen is rho times d. Then the sensitivity of the PET scanner, uh, we have seen before, is proportional to d, the small d divided by the big d. Um, and then we have to multiply uh, that with the attenuation of each of the photons. So that's A squared, one A for one photon and the other A for the other photon. And then both photons need to be detected, epsilon squared. This epsilon is actually important because in real scanners, this is epsilon is definitely not one. And for example, suppose epsilon is 0.8, which sounds like a good value, then the chances of acquiring a photon pair is only 64% because you need to square. 
Okay, so if you combine all these factors I just said, this is the result that you will have. Now we can do the same for the scatters, but then it's important to realize that the scatter photons are less correlated. So one photon can come from all the way up here and the other can take a different trajectory and also get detected. So the activity, the, the scattering activity scene is larger than the truth activity scene. So with the crude approximation, we can say, well, the scatters can come from the line between these two dashed lines here, because from here, it's possible to get a photon into the detector. And so the length of this thing is d times d divided by t. We have that for the activity. And um, then a second difference is that the, we said that the sensitivity for truth equals d divided by t. But that is because both photons are connected. If we measure one of the photons, we will also see the other one for symmetry reasons. But that is not true for scatter. The, the photons uh, have less correlated trajectories. So we need, uh, in the first approximation, we need to multiply this with the square of d divided by t, because we have a d divided by d for one photon and the same factor for another. There will be some constants in between, but we ignore those. And if you combine, yeah, also we need the probability of a photon to scatter. And with some little calculations, you can see that this equals mu times r, because mu is the probability of interaction per unit length. And R is the length here that they travel. So that is producing the number of photons. And then these photons can be attenuated and um, have to be detected. Combining all that will produce this uh, result. For the singles, <coughs> we have the same um, activity that can contribute singles. So they can come from all, from everywhere, as long as the photon can manage to get between these septa here into the detector. And then, uh, so that's the activity rho times um, d multiplied with the big D and divided by t. Then we have to multiply that with uh, the sensitivity, which is again this small d divided by the big D. And then there is only one photon, so a and epsilon should not be squared here. So this is the probability for a signal. Now for the randoms, we have. Uh, the single, so yeah, you should know that rho is bigger L. So this is activity in, or, or number of photons emitted per time. So to know how many are actually emitted or to produce it as, as uh, yeah, to know how many are emitted, we need to multiply this with uh, acceptance, we know, especially for the random. So we consider two singles, but they have to arrive simultaneously. So if we consider a very small time window, the probability of seeing one single is this multiplied with that tau. The probability of seeing two at the same times is the square of that. And per unit of time, we divide away one of the taus, but the other one survives. That's why we get here the square of this multiplied with this tau. Where we get the obvious result, first of all, that the, if we decrease tau, the coincidence we know, we will see fewer randoms. If we decrease the activity, the randoms decrease with the square of that activity. And that is because, uh, yeah, we need to square the probability of scenes, you know, and they are proportional to that. All right. Okay, so now the septa, they were important. So the first scanners that were made looked really like this. So there was just one detectoring and they were nicely shielded to get, uh, to suppress the uh, nasty contributions of activity outside the field of view. And you can see if I increase the length of the septa, I suppress scatters. I suppress singles and I suppress the randoms, which is good, and I don't suppress truths. So the longer the septa, the better. The only problem is if you make them too long, the patient will not feel it. Then the second generation, if you wish, of scanners had multiple of those rings, but the septa were kept in place because, uh, first of all, otherwise too, too many data would be generated. And at that time, the computers didn't have enough memory to deal with all that. And in addition, there were no reconstruction algorithms to deal with fully 3D data, which is why the fully 3D conference has been created. And then later, the septa were removed. Okay, so truth, remember this d squared, 
because we're gonna do something with that t. So you should remember this squared for the truth, squared for the singles, third power for the scatter, and fourth power for the amplitude. So now you see that here coming back. So this is uh, an old scanner with septa, so a set of rings which are basically operated independent to keep things simple, manageable for a small computer and with conventional operators. And then later the septa were removed, but as you can see, that creates all kinds of problems. So if we have n rings, then we have to take these values and multiply them by n because each of these rings will say the same activity. So the number of truths we will see is proportional to d squared. This, then the other factors which we will keep constant and then n, which is the number of rings. And the same is true for the singles, scatters are the third power and the randoms are the fourth power. If now we remove the septa, then actually we should use these same expressions that we used here, but now we should put that n in here because this d is the distance between those septa. So that becomes n d. So we have to raise that n to the same power. Therefore, we get here d squared times n squared, n to the third, n squared, n to the fourth. And here you see another reason why people were in the beginning reluctant to do away with this septa. Because if you do away with the septa, the number of scatters goes up much faster than the true. So your sensitivity gets better because you see more truths than here. That's good. And the reason is, of course, that you have these oblique lines, which are not present here because the septa will stop. But the number of scatters goes up much faster than that. And so that is indeed our experience in these old PET systems. You could get away with very simple scatter correction or even ignore the scatter completely. It would create a little bit of bias, but not dramatically so. If now in our 3D PET scanners you ignore scatter, you get very significant bias and the images are not quantitative anymore. The number of singles also increases and that makes the number of randoms much higher. And we see that too, if we do a typical brain scan, the number of randoms is similar to the number of truths, same order of magnitude. That was not true at all in the old PET system. So randoms, their contribution can be estimated. So correcting for randoms is not too difficult. Singles just determine that time, but the detectors are getting faster and faster. Not too dramatic problem here. The main problem is these scatters. And so when the septa were removed and we went to fully 3D, it was very important to come up with good scatter correction algorithms. And that research is still going on. Our experience is that current scatter corrections are good, but not definitely not perfect and often create problems. <laughs> 